for me, a good cup of coffee is black, no sugar, and with uh, coconut oil whipped in and a touch of cinnamon on top. We're wearing, coffee, wearing, we're wearing coffee shop attire. We are wearing coffee shop It's called today. stretchy pants and boots, and I put my big sloppy sweater on. Yay! Like Welcome to Flying for Flavor. We have been, uh, she's been itching to do a coffee show for I don't know how long now. Long time. She's very excited. Um, we couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out whether we were going to say it's because we are coffee, <laughs> coffee junkies or coffee snobs. I think a little bit of both. I don't know that I'm really a junkie, but I'm definitely a coffee snob. If I could, if I get a good cup of coffee, I will drink it all day, but I will not drink crap coffee. Yeah, so see, and I just like to, yeah, see, for me, it's just, I can drink, um, I grew up in households where my grandmother always had, she'd make one pot after another after another, whether we were at camp in the summer and she used to run around with her little percolator or we were at home, but it would just be big pots of coffee and it was always on all day, every day. Yeah. So you learn to drink whatever's made, right? We didn't have this pour over yeah. thingies. I mean, my, my mother used to stock up on canned milk. That was her. Well, and we, I was the same, but I never liked it. So I've, again, we've established on the show that I'm kind of picky <laughs> um, and I don't like drip coffee. And I, I say it a number of times, you'll hear it in a video later as well. I'm not a fan of Tim Hortons coffee. Um, I don't like drip coffee. I just, I, I find it watered down beans basically. So, but when I moved to Australia and was introduced to a good quality um, espresso coffee, even though uh, when we lived in Brisbane, Brisbane's considered like the poor neighbor com compared to Sydney and Melbourne when it comes to coffee. Um, but it was still way better than anything I had ever had here. And that's when I started drinking coffee was when I started going to the, the coffee shops there and recognizing that their hot chocolate was crap. I had to find something else because it, <laughs> it was mostly like a bitter like, oh. a, like a dark chocolate kind of based as opposed to our fluffy milk chocolate based hot chocolate. Mm. So that's when I switched to coffee there. Yeah, I just, I mean, I drink my coffee black. I actually, before we're taping this show, where it's a Thursday today, there's this big debate on Twitter last night. I was, saying, I was just looking at that and I love the comment. I got a, I got, oh, go ahead. I've got a comment for it. was for this it. comment about people saying, oh yeah, I can't understand why people are drinking black, co their coffee black because coffee naturally tastes like garbage. And I'm thinking, you are so drinking the wrong coffee. Yes, I will agree with that, but I love this line that goes with that same tweet that says, people who drink their coffee black with no cream or sugar need to donate their brains to science when they die. I need to understand why you like to drink something that tastes like trash. And that's the whole thing is that I don't, and I don't think it does, and I find sometimes if you have so much milk in it, like even with this, this is a flat white, which you'll see a demo there shortly, but um, I can still taste the coffee in this. Yeah. And one of the things I find is sometimes there's so much stuff, there are more coffee drinks and you're not even tasting coffee anymore. Like some of them have such strong flavor combinations and stuff that are out there. I mean, hey, if you want to drink it, that's fine. But on the other hand, like there's a lot of times I just want, I just want to taste the coffee. I want that warm liquid. I want to be able to almost burn my throat with it. It just makes me happy. But the key, and I think the thing is, and the big difference between like uh, like a lot of coffees you have and a good coffee is there's a lot of science to it. Mm -hmm. There's, um, you'll often find in like fast food places or coffee shops, you'll get burnt coffee because the temperature's not right when they're brewing it and not paying close enough attention to it. Or you'll get it where it's like acidic. And again, that's got to do with either how they're pulling it or how they're, um, how they're brewing it. Um, and that's what makes a huge difference. And that's why for me, like when you have a good quality espresso, it should have almost a creaminess to it, even without the coffee in it. Yeah. Because there's, in the bean of the cof of coffee bean, there's, there's fat in it. Like there's oil, there's not fat, but there's oil in it. And if that's extracted properly through the espresso, it's got like almost a creaminess. And that's why I love, we've got, believe it or not, the best coffee I get in Sudbury, and I feel bad because we're at an amazing coffee shop who's really lovely, and they have good coffee. They but do. the best espresso I get here in town is at our local Italian club, at the Crusoe Club. Oh, that would make sense, yeah. The guys there know how to pull it. They buy a good quality Italian bean, and it is phenomenal. Anytime I do an event there, they see me, they're like, you want an espresso? I'm like, oh, please, I love you right now. <laughs> and they'll pull out the espresso and make me a coffee. So that's, it, there's a lot to it more than just throwing some grounds in, th in a basket and pulling some water through it. And it's that science and that care that when you get a good barista, pays attention to that, and you get a much better cup of coffee. And that's why we're here. Exactly. And I do have to say that our barista today 
made me the best coffee I've ever had Ooh. at this coffee shop. So Ooh. let's just oh, no salute, pressure. To, salute to her. Don't see her. She's over here. Salute. Did you say salute? <laughs> So we should share that we, so we are. should say we're at a um, at a coffee shop called Salute Coffee <laughs> That's Company uh, here in Sudbury. Um, so well, as I mentioned in the last episode or the last couple episodes, we're definitely choosing places right now to sort of feature because they are participating in our first annual Flavor Fest. Yay! So we're actually killing two birds with one stone um, for this location. So uh, Salute Coffee Company, not this location, but their South End location is going to be holding uh, Chemex master classes. And we'll talk to you a minute about what Chemex is. But it is, um, they're doing master classes uh, from 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11 a.m. Uh, for two of the days during that weekend. And then, and you know where Cynthia is going to be at that point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then on the Saturday afternoon, um, our special guest Stephanie, who's actually busy running the shop here today, she also teaches uh, barista classes outside of uh, Salute here. And she was actually trained when she was in Australia, which was kind of cool. So now that she's back, she runs classes at a local place where I used to teach cooking classes. So she's kind of like taken my spot. So where I used to do like food and wine pairing stuff, uh, now I'm kind of on the road with that. She's doing all of the barista classes there, which is kind of fun. So she's actually going to do a class there. So she was nice enough to let us come in and um, let Cynthia play in the back. Thank you for letting me play today, Stephanie. <laughs> and her name is Stephanie. Too, I'm not surrounded to by Stephanie today. To, yes, not to confuse things. So, so uh, we'll see this beautiful flat white. Can we, uh, one of the questions that actually when we were going over the show notes, and as much as I love coffee, I had no idea what Chemex was. So can okay. you maybe explain what Chemex is? Yeah, so Chemex is a brand of coffee maker. Uh, it is made back in 1941, uh, and it was just the way that it was designed. By Dr. Peter Schlumbaum, PhD. <laughs> PhD. Uh, it's actually uh, considered a piece of art. It's uh, a beautiful, I would, I would totally put this look. Yeah. Like, anything cool on so my you could just pretty much any like really good coffee shop will probably have these chemex things for sale so you'll see they're looking it looks like here. a big glass I'm beaker gonna go, i'm gonna grab one just to show you okay glass beaker and it has like a wood collar on it with a little band uh, and it's meant for almost like that forever style so it's the traditional style where you used to have a um a paper filter uh or in a cone shape at the top and then you'd actually pour the cup isn't it pretty look at that that is the Chemex. <laughs> Way to go, Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that you already described it for our uh -huh. listeners, but it's, it is a beautiful piece. Like I, It's in I museums, which I think is pretty cool. So the fact that it's just the, the design and everything else, it is made to make the perfect cup of coffee. And you can actually look at the, I'll put the link in the show notes to the Chemex um, coffee uh, company, which will actually give you a little bit more in depth if you want to learn more about um, how the system works, why their paper filters are better than other ones, why it's better to use paper than metal filters and all that kind of stuff. So you'll get to learn that. And so or, it makes like a drip coffee. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like you'd get out of your drip machine on your counter instead of using an electric drip machine, you'd use this to make it like well, a traditional Well, the funny thing is, you know what I saw? Coffee. They actually have one of those that is designed with an automated one. Oh, interesting. I know. So on their website, it's sold out right now, but I was fascinated by it. But anyways, mm -hmm. they make it, it looks like a regular um, coffee machine and it has a, a plate for it and it's meant for and the water heats and so drips it does it and it does it by itself. I thought that's cool. Because that's part of the art of it. It's like literally like an art to do Chemex it coffee. It is. Because like, so, it's all about how you pour it, the temperature that it is mm -hmm. and all of that as well. So if you happen to be in Sudbury area, uh, make sure either the Saturday or the Sunday morning. So there's going to be the, uh, so there'll be six demos uh, for that the weekend that you'll be able to learn about the Chemex classes. Or if you want to learn how to basically be a barista at home, uh, you can take in Stephanie Boney's classes. Her business is called Banter and Coffee. Um, and she's going to be teaching said Saturday at three. So I'll have the links to those as well as all the other Flavor Fest stuff in our show notes. And we are episode 21 of season two today. Excited! What? So that's, uh, so the, of course, the show notes is always stephaniepichet.ca slash flavor 2 21. So that's season number dash 21 is the episode. Perfect cup of coffee is black and very strong. Well, kicking horse, kick-ass coffee is my money go Okay. Industry updates. Industry updates. Okay, I got some good ones this time. <laughs> let me let me pull it up. I'm very excited. Cynthia's kind of taken over the industry updates because she gets way more excited about them than I, I do. I get very excited about this <laughs> stuff, and and I've I've already told Stephanie that I'm making up. We're gonna have my own segment soon, called WTAF. Because you'd see me when I see these things, I'm like, what the actual fuck? There was our E. Um, <laughs> are they thinking? Are they doing? So I, yeah, very excited about this. So I've got a couple of industry updates and a couple of like, what the fuck? So let's, uh, let's pull it up. I just lost uh, my Twitter feed where I had them all saved. So 
the first one, um, and this is an industry update, and this is just, I thought, interesting, and it was this idea that um, veganism is no longer a niche market in the industry in that, whereas in the past, it's like vegans, you'd have like the odd little vegan shop in the corner, or the you'd have maybe one vegan item on your menu, and um, the industry, food industry, industry and the restaurant industry is showing that it's actually becoming a regular thing, like having like meat on your menu. So it's no longer just, oh, you have the vegan for the odd weirdo hipster in the corner who wants to have vegan, but it's now a regular um, accepted part of food hospitality. And it's not necessarily considered just a trend anymore. No, this is something so that's not going away. It's, gonna, it's here to stay. And, and I think that's really great because, um, I mean, I've had some fantastic vegan food. We have a, a Mexican restaurant here that's completely vegan. Ve vegan, not vegan. Actually, my dad calls it vegan. vegan. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> vegan. Um, and I actually had no idea the first two times I went. Mm -hmm. No clue. I'm having my nachos thinking it's ground beef and it was fantastic. And then someone told me it was vegan and I went, what? I had no idea. So, so shout out to Tuco's Tacos. Yes. Fantastic. My, it's one of my son's favorite restaurants to go to actually. Mm -hmm. But my husband, as soon as he heard it was vegan, he wouldn't go. I know, my son was And now way. he's claiming that it tastes, I'm like, you're just a no, weirdo. No, you would not good. have, no. So, uh, so I think that's really cool. And I love to see that the industry is, is, is changing kind of with the times, right? And with what people are looking it's for. It's just a different style of cooking. It's a different types of ingredients. One is not necessarily better than the other. It just has to do with your own personal preference. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting, now this isn't necessarily a like industry-wide thing, but I thought this was, so there's a, blah, blah, blah. so there's a super exclusive restaurant in, Japan, it only seats 16 people, and you actually have to be interviewed beforehand, before you go. Yeah. I am... No. I don't even know what to say about this. I'm like, why would I'm I I'm not auditioning but, to get a seat in your restaurant. No, nope, you're not that good. Sorry. I, I don't even know. I, 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 I literally don't even know what to say. I mean, it's... No, no, like just no. I mean, I don't know if there's anything else we can say other than no. Like, is that's this a good a hashtag. Thing? Hashtag just no. Just no. Yeah, you know what? Because we've got a couple of just no's today. Hashtag just, just, just no. Just no. Um, my thing is, if I'm paying to be there, why do I have to beg to be there? So is this a thing? So I guess I want to actually, this is my kind of shout out to our listeners and our viewers this week. Do you want to go to a restaurant where they're going to interview you and let you know if you're good enough to go? Like, I just, I can't wrap my head around it. There are some people they like to be able to brag that they got yeah, to go someplace. Yeah, it's an exclusivity thing. Yeah, that doesn't appeal to me. No, I'm an inclusive. You can sit at my table. You can eat at my restaurant. Yeah. Unless you're an asshole and then I'll just kick you out. <laughs> okay, so there's a little bit of fussiness. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But I think that's fair. I think mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're cruel to people around you, you shouldn't be. That's right. Okay, so actually this is like a, um, a health and safety thing for our folks in the States. Uh-oh. Um, Tyson Foods recently recalled uh, 36,000 pounds of chicken nuggets after pieces of rubber were found in the food. This is the hashtag just now. So I actually sent this to Steph and the first thing I said to her was, how did they know? Have you ever <laughs> eaten a chicken nugget? They taste like They're rubber. Not, hey, <laughs> that's been my drive through when I'm spending way too much time in the car See, thing to get me through. I think, it, I think what it is, and this is very few, my, again, I, I, my poor parents, I do knock their cooking a lot only because they were both full-time working, very busy all the time. We had a lot of it. I grew up in the 80s where it was like instant everything and yep. frozen everything. But my parents always made fresh chicken fingers. Oh, did they? So just you know, chicken yeah. breasts with like in the egg with the breadcrumbs yep. and salt and pepper. So to this day, like I don't think I've, I have certainly never bought chicken fingers or nuggets at home. Yeah, I'm not a chicken we finger. We always person. make them fresh. I never buy them. When so I'm to even. eat them when I'm out, I'm like I make better ones at home, so I just can't do it. But I just thought if you're eating a nugget and I'm not nugget, McDonald's is my favorite fast food place but I will never eat a chicken nugget because it tastes like I'm eating rubber. So I'm like, how did they know? This is what I want to know. How did they know? <laughs> they didn't okay. say what kind of rubber, but anyways, it's a whole other. Oh, that's a whole other, that, that's a whole other <laughs> tangent, my friends. Okay, and so here, so for my what the actual fuck, we've got a video that we're gonna show you. So I apologize for you folks who are listening, um, but if you go, it'll be in our show notes, you can click on it and see this video. Uh, with the mm. Miracle Whip oh. Martini. Yep, yeah, nope. At first, so, I actually thought it was a, oh, there must be something really cool. So nope. I'm just going to look at it, and, and I think Steph's I even, probably going to okay, run it. I don't it, even like Miracle Whip to start off with. Not a big fan please, of Miracle Whip to start please with. Please don't knock me if you happen to be a Miracle Whip fan. It was a thing back in the, I think it was 70s and 80s when 70s it started. 70s and 80s, yeah. It started, and my mom still uses it for making our macaroni salad or potato salad. And ever since I started using real, real mayonnaise. mayonnaise and everything else, I noticed Miracle Whip is sweet. Right, yeah. that's salad dressing as opposed to, so I wasn't, I'm not a fan of it to start off with. So my stomach did a bit of a bloop, bloop. 
But I need to this. tell you what's in this because it gets grosser. <laughs> you think it's gross now. So it's, a, again, Miracle Whip Martini. And actually, I think it's got a name. It's actually called the, the American Miracle Cocktail. <laughs> no, A, American Merkin. Miracle Whip. Okay, so there's a tablespoon of Mir Miracle Whip. There is a honey mustard syrup, cheeseburger-infused gin, and all I think is like, did you literally put like a cheeseburger patty? No, 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 gross. Um, lemon and lime. Mm -hmm. And so with our lemon and lime and all this stuff, let's add some dairy. Let's add some heavy cream. I'm just seeing it curdle as we're talking about it. And then you shake it with ice, you pour it into your coop, and then let's just garnish it with some cold french fries. I think it was the french fries at the end that really made I think it just puts it over, uh, yeah, no. So, I'm just picturing like cold McDonald's things at the bottom of the bag. Oh. Hashtag just no. Just no. <laughs> just no. <laughs> just no. So that's our industry updates for this week. And so for this week's dining dues, because we are in the coffee shop, uh, your dining dues, dining due is going to be coffee related, obviously. Uh, so here's your dining due, sponsored by Legacy Service Academy for personal and professional learning. So hi, my name is Stephanie Bonnet. I'm the manager here at the downtown location of Salute Coffee Company. Um, I also run my little side business, Banter and Coffee, where I teach. Uh, home espresso machine owners how to use it properly and clean it and all that stuff. Um, my dining due in terms of being a customer at a coffee shop would be uh, just be specific what, with what you'd like. Uh, coffee definitions everywhere you go around the world and even here in Sudbury can um, drastically change. So just be specific on what you want so you're not disappointed with what you're given. So what to look for when you're looking um, at a coffee shop to see if it's good or not. Uh, roast date on the coffee beans, that's a big one. Uh, coffee does have a shelf life or it's best within a month of being roasted. Uh, so you definitely want to see that. It definitely loses uh, the freshness, flavor and all the good stuff you're looking for after about a month. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, also cleanliness. You definitely want to see the bristles wiping up, all of the, uh, like the, the stuff. Couch, clean couch yeah, you just want to see like a, a nice clean workspace. That's a big one. You don't want to see them reusing milk in the same steam jug. You want to see them uh, rinsing it out after every use. Um, just that's I would say that's a big one for me, anyways, when I'm out. So coffee. Yes, because I have to admit. There's rarely a coffee that someone's poured for me that, unless it's really burnt, burnt mm -hmm. coffee, because I drink mine black, mm -hmm. I really notice it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm a little bit fussier on it. There are certain coffee shops that I don't like their coffee on its own enough that those are the places that I know if I have to be there, I will have either milk or something in it. If I'm going to a place and I know the coffee's good, I will either have, sometimes not necessarily espresso, like I had an Americano here when I came mm -hmm. back. Kind of slugged that thing back when I got here while I was setting up. Um, and an Americano is basically an espresso with extra water in it. Yeah, it's just basically, it's so it's not, so you can drink it, especially when you're drinking it black. I happen to like an Americano just as is. Um, but aside from that, I don't know a lot about, I mean, I know latte and I know, but I don't even make them myself at home. So what about being, say that being the coffee snob, like what is it about or the certain things that you really learn to appreciate about coffee? I need you to school me a little bit because. Okay, I'll do my best. So I'm, I'm definitely newbie. not an expert by any stretch, but, um, but this is, so I mentioned a little bit earlier that idea of like, it really is a science mm -hmm. making a good cup of coffee. And it's got to do with temperature of your water, it's got to do with freshness of your beans, it's got to do with um, the grind, how they're ground, how long they're pulled from the espresso machine. Um, there's just so many factors that go into a good cup of coffee, it's no wonder it's really hard to get a good cup. And I mentioned earlier that when it comes to an espresso, that creaminess, like having that kind of full flavor without the burnt taste, without the ashy taste. Um, uh, the burnt taste really gets to me. You That's know, the without the, and me, it's, I don't like that ashy taste, but we've said that in wine in the past where I've had like an ashy wine, I was going, nope, nope, too ashy, I can't do it. So there's all these factors that go into it. So you want to start with a good fresh um, bean. Yep. Um, and when you're, if you are doing a home brewing at home, you want to buy it by the bean. 
and not buy the um, pre-ground. Pre -ground. You can do pre-ground, don't get me wrong, but you want to use it up relatively quickly. And if you talk to your local, whoever's doing your grounding for you, they'll explain how long your, your grounds are going to stay fresh. Um, I just recently, when I went to Australia back in the fall, I actually brought back my favorite um, coffee from there. It's an Australian blend that's available at Merlot Coffee. Um, and our beans are in the freezer. By keeping them in the freezer, it helps extend. Okay, so can you do the same thing with ground coffee? Because I can. Yes, because that's where I store mine. So when I travel and I buy coffee to bring home, I take those bags and I immediately throw them in the freezer. You want to also make sure that they're airtight. Yes. Because if there's any air in them, just like anything else you put in the freezer, it's freezer it's, burnt. It's going to get freezer burnt. Yep. So you want to keep them in the freezer. And then what we do with ours is we actually have a burr. Uh, grinder on oh speaking of which i still have your spice grinder now that i think about it i have two coffee grinders um, <laughs> <laughs> one of them i don't even use for coffee that's all no because it's not ver it it doesn't work very well for coffee either no um but there's also different types of grinders there's the regular grinder which i forget what it's called and there's a burr grinder so we have a burr grinder in our kitchen because it does it, the science behind it makes a better better grind um and we literally grind it by the cup and you'll see that in most good coffee shops they're literally grinding your beans and that gives you that freshest um possible cup of coffee um, from there, it's it's the science that Stephanie's going to show us a little bit more in a video shortly of, yep. of how how to pull and the, the um, ratio of um, coffee to uh, water to the milk that you're putting in it as well. So there's just so much that goes into a good cup of coffee. Balance. Um, very much a balance. And again, like this chemistry kind of thing. And that's why I laughed at the Chemex. I'm like, it's just such a chemistry sounding name for a I'm coffee I'm sure maker. that's exactly why. And it looks like a beaker. It does. It absolutely does. Mm -hmm. So I think so. Again, so it's you know you want fresh, good ingredients to start. You want to be aware of, of the the factors in making it, whether it's the right temperature and all those kinds of things. And then um, at the very end, it's just that finesse of the ratios of what to what. Okay. So my coffee in there is good. Now, when you said you grind yours at home, uh, are you using it in a machine after that, or using a French press? Like, how are you making your so coffee? So I after actually that? do have uh, a manual coffee uh, espresso machine okay. at home. So we used to have an automated one, and there's some really great um, Breville makes some really great automated ones for at home. If you don't want to get into all this fuss that we're talking about, um, our first machine when we came back from Australia was meant to be just our just for now and then we'll get a better machine, which we had for three years. Um, it, uh, we literally just had to put our beans in the top and it gave us uh, a good espresso pull on the bottom. It was completely automated. So there are those options. Um, but I use uh, a DeLonghi machine that has um, the, uh, the handle like you, that you'll see the, yep. with the basket that you'll see Stephanie using. And so we grind them, then we measure them into the, into the um, basket like Stephanie, you'll see Stephanie doing a bit. Yep tamp it and make it just like we saw her do and we've got the steamer okay. on the side and that's the whole well. thing is that i mean we're still using a normally drinks Keurig. coffee i mean he doesn't even finish the whole cup like he'll make himself one and it sits there mm. uh and i'll see it like he'll go for a shower and stuff in the morning and he still that's hasn't me. finished the first one and i'll go through probably two but a lot of times it's, i'm having it quickly on the go i would take more time to do to make a really good cup and there's been a couple of times where in between like the the keurig Either I need to clean it or I'm not liking it anymore. It's giving me some issues. So then I'll go through and I'll get, um, I'll take out my French press. And yeah. I do like my French press. Uh, and I'll do that especially for, actually, and it's not a Keurig. You can use Keurig cups. Mine's a Hamilton Beach. Cheating. But I like the fact that it has a separate basket that I can yeah. interchange and I can use my good coffee from Jamaica, Cuba, wherever. Um, so I'm actually using like decent coffee and I can control the amount that's in it because those pre-measured cup things, yeah. you don't You're always know whatever. what's in them, right? So at least I can control that part. But I do want to, and we keep talking about like, are we going to get in? Some friends are trying to talk us into the Nespresso. I've heard good things about it. I haven't tried it yet. Every time I go buy an espresso store, I want to go in and try it. I feel like I'm getting back into those pod situations. It is, and you're stuck <laughs> on the pods at that point, right? And that's yeah, what I don't like so that's it. why I'm kind of thinking, like, if we're going to do this, and we had, I think when we first got married years ago, someone got us a small um, whole uh, espresso maker, and it just, in the foaming, th like, nothing ever worked properly on it, and I think we just gave up on the system, and then we were both, we both worked so much that it was like, we just need something that's going to throw some hot liquid in a cup, and then we're just going to be done with it, and I, I don't mind that for during the week, but on the weekends, yeah. I, to take that extra time to do it right makes and that's And that's exactly what I was going to say about it, so when... Um what I like about our the manual espresso maker I have now is I control how long the pull is for the espresso, and um, I am picky about how it's frothed, um, so I, I get to control the amount of froth I've got, the amount of stretch in the milk, and all that kind of thing, because I like mine really stretched and really thick. Um, but it does take time. 
Like when uh, Nana and my sister-in-law visit, uh, you know, it's taken me 10 minutes to make three coffees because uh, we also, and, and I, I'm glad Mark doesn't listen to this because we probably should have invested in the double boiler. And explain what a double, double boiler is when you've got where the espresso pulls out and you've got the steam wand. Yep. A single boiler, you can do the espresso, then you need to wait, then once you're done pulling the espresso, you can steam your milk. But with a double boiler, you can do both at the same time. So if you're making more than like one or two cups of coffee at a time, you got to do the double boiler. Okay. My challenge was we were buying uh, after Christmas with the Christmas sales, and the machine we bought was regular like six hundred dollars, and we got it for three hundred. Wow. And to go to the double boiler was like twelve hundred. I was just like, it made no sense to. It was like an extra eight hundred or some dollars. I went. That's no. almost a trip for me. Right. And that's exactly. What I was. I'm like, I could buy two of these coffee makers to get one of those. And I just went no. So, but I will say, if you're if you're pulling more than two on a regular basis, you need the double boiler for sure. Okay. But but for at home, um, like you're saying, the challenge is the time that it takes and the care that it takes and the attention to detail. And if you don't have time for that, some of them, the automatic machines, I still wouldn't do, I guess, as a snob. When it comes to a good espresso, um, I would still do an automated espresso machine over like a Keurig or a, an espresso. And again, not to knock them because they make a great filtered kind of coffee, but not. I think that's one of those things I think we need to, need to go shopping and browsing and stuff and not necessarily, I mean, we've gone into Nespresso stores and we've been in Europe. Um, and those are like boutiques. They the are security they guards. Hear, it's a little insane. They're fancy. They're fancy. Um, but I think that's one of those things. I just need to be playing around with them a little bit myself, and then I'll kind of be able. You just to have to come play with mine. <gasps> Invitation accepted. So all that said, now you've heard from the amateur. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at Stephanie Bonin showing me how to make a good cup of coffee. Perfect. So what um, I'd like you to do mm -hmm. is show us how to make a proper, we're going to do like a latte based, like an espresso based kind of drink. Cool. Does that make sense? Like a latte or a cappuccino? Maybe you can explain to us while you're doing it the difference yeah, between absolutely. like a latte and a mocha and a flat white and all of those kinds yeah. of things. Cool. So we can make a flat white. That's Perfect. Um, so they're all espresso based, obviously. So what changes is the milk to foam ratio right. in most of the cups. Uh, cappuccino obviously being a little bit foamier than the lattes, and then flat white even less foam. Yeah. Um, so first off, we'll grab the porter filter here, um, just flush out any excess grounds that might have been caught on the screen from the last one. So I noticed um, that you've left the green coffee grounds in it uh, while it was, was that, a, is that a typical, is that something you would recommend or should we be dumping it? Um, this one doesn't have it, normally mm -hmm. it's habit that I do clean them but then keep them here just to keep them hot. Right. Um, I don't see, it's kind of a micro difference, like some some baristas keep it in, some keep it Interesting. clean. Oh. Um, it just depends on how busy you are too and how much time. <laughs> exactly. Because um, ultimately, even if there's grounds, even without, you're going to have to dry it anyways right. um, before you put the new grounds in. So, right. uh, so here I just knocked the puck out in the tube that we have there. Which is one of my favorite parts. Yeah. I take my aggression out by banging in the coffee <laughs> grounds. <laughs> And then we dry out the basket here, mm -hmm. and then we like to weigh it out. Um, reason being is that the Mazda grinders, uh, though they're consistent with the grind size, they're not always consistent with the dosing. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of zero out here, and then I'll put a double in there. I'm still excited about that weighing the thing. <laughs> So then we weigh. Um, the recipe changes daily. Uh, the parameters set by Pilot um, are, tend to be pretty good ones, uh, though they change kind of throughout depending on how much grinds are in the hopper, uh, how much the grinder's being used that day. So we just kind of dial it in every so often. And is there a certain like, recommended weight for a dose for like a single versus a double, or does it depend on the coffee? Yeah, so here we only pull doubles, um, and it could be anywhere between like 17 and 20 grams, depending on how big the basket is, Got it. Uh, depending on the roast, dark, light, all that kind of plays into it. So um, Pilot's recommended about 17.5 in their um, heritage roast is what we use here. So I was pretty happy with what we've got there, 17.6, close enough. Uh, now we evenly distribute the grinds in the basket. Uh, the way we do that, the most effective way is just to tap the side of the basket. Reason being is when I want to tamp it, I want it all to be evenly dispersed. Water um, follows the path of least resistance. So if it's uneven, I'm only going to be extracting the coffee on the one side. Yeah. Okay. So now that I've tapped it, I kind of put it to the side, grab the tamper, and I want to get my elbow up right there and then just polish off and wipe away the excess grinds that might be kind of there, that might get in there. That's pretty. 
So there. It's definitely an art, and there's a science to it as well. It's not just like we're just throwing coffee together. Absolutely. There's a whole lot of like it's very specific. Yes, definitely. Um, we're just we're all, you're looking for consistency, basically, right? Like if you have a good cup of coffee, you kind of want to know why, yeah, what goes into it. Um, so we just kind of try to see how much we're putting in, how much we're getting out, at what time. So we're trying to time it so we can just adjust the one thing, which is the grind. Awesome. So I'm going to grab this. Yep. And we also want to know how much is coming out. So we're looking for a one to two ratio. So what we put in, we're doubling what we take out. Got it. More or less. There's some room to wiggle. Cool. So I just, again, I purge the water just to make sure. And then I put it in. Um, so now we are pressing this. And I'm timing it for about 28 seconds. Very cool. So um, we were talking earlier, and we both lived in Australia. Yes. And we've already got a bit of a rivalry going on because I lived in Brizzy, and she lived in Melbourne. And uh, Brizzy is not exactly known for its food and coffee, whereas Melbourne is. Yes. Now I loved Brisbane food and, and coffee, but yeah. I didn't live in Melbourne. So tell me a little bit about your experience there. Um, I absolutely loved it. Uh, it took me a little while to figure out that everything there, um, anything cool and good is hidden. It's true. So a lot of the tourists don't know that. So a lot of the good places in town um, in the financial district are all down alleyways. Yes. And um, they're just like not advertised in your face. It's all so hidden true. and it's all word of mouth. So um, true. The best, actually, we did an espresso martini a few shows ago. Mm -hmm. And the best espresso martini I ever had was a back alley. My girlfriend and I call it the dungeon bar because mm. it's a back alley of Queen Street Mall, which is like the main, it's not even just touristy. Like even people who live there go there all the time. If yeah. you live in the CBD, you're always there. But it's down and in behind. There's no sign. It's completely unmarked. You go, and you go enough. in. It's like you're in someone's like basement. Yeah. Literally. And it's, there's no decor. It's just, but the most amazing drinks I have had in a very long time there. They're all hidden. Yeah. Mine, I've, I have, I've had such a memorable espresso machine in a place. Um, it's called Naked for Satan. And it was downtown. Um, well not downtown. It was this uh, neighborhood called Fitzroy in mm -hmm. Melbourne. It was like a side kind of place. But their espresso martinis, they actually get a cafe um, in town to uh, properly dial in and do their espresso correctly. So then there's like, there's no room for it. That's these guys. So they that. serve coffee as well. So they pull the coffee themselves out of their typically how they would do it. And they yeah. make their martinis yeah. fantastic. It's amazing. Cool. Okay, so now we're gonna do the milk. Yes. Now, does the type of milk matter when you're frothing? Um, it just like in terms of like what you're looking for for microfoam, mm -hmm. yes. Um, almond milk, like if you're looking at unsweetened almond milk, you won't get the nice, um, silky, smooth texture as you would with um, regular milk because it's the um, protein found in the milk that kind of supports and binds the bubbles. So because before. it's got different proteins, it stretches it differently? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what about your fat content in the milk? Fat content, um, again, doesn't matter with microfoam, um, but it does, in my opinion, if it tastes. Yeah. So with like um, homogenized milk or like 2% even, I find um, when you're sipping it, it kind of like lasts longer when you're yeah. taking a sip. Whereas like 1%, you'll taste it, but then it kind it's of... It's gone. Yeah. That's what I found because when I was, so I so from living in, in Brisbane, I came home and I needed to have an espresso machine because the idea of drinking Tim Hortons, sorry Tim Hortons, was just not gonna cut it for me. <laughs> Even Starbucks, we all look, turned down our noses or up our noses at Starbucks when we, we lived over there. Yeah. So, but my, I found when I came home, I was never able to get that kind of richness or that kind of, and then I just recently switched from 1% to 3%. And, and I've noticed a difference. Yeah, so I'm the same. We're a family of 1% drinkers. Um, and I find when I drink here, at work specifically, I drink 3.25%. Uh, yeah. um, it's not to say, I'm trying to, it's life's about balance, obviously. So I just have the one latte, because it is a really, really thick Rich. filling. Um, but I just find my portion sizes get smaller. So I can justify, because it's just, say, I'm making myself a little yeah. A little latte or a cup of coffee in here. Like, it's just a little bit it's of It's not it. like you're having the big bucket. Oh, Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I feel yeah. like it's good fat. It's not like French fry fat. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's milk. Yeah. Okay, exactly. so let's take a look at some froth or how to do the cool. steaming of the so milk. So we'll be using um, whole milk again. Uh, I have to fill this one here. This is my milk. And then getting really picky, does it matter if you're starting with cold or room temperature uh, milk or it just means it'll take longer? Um, it does take longer. Like we, we, use, we just always go from cold milk right off the hob. We don't re-steam milk. It's just not good practice. 
So every time we steam milk, even if there's leftover, we use this kind of jug to kind of clean it out. And so I want one always, of those for home. Yeah, <laughs> it would be really handy. Um, so now that we have our perfectly extra extracted it's almost double what espresso, we had. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, we're just going to purge this again because there's maybe some residual milk or some leftover stuff in there that's undesired. Um, and then with steaming the milk, we always want to fill it up to about half. Um, reason being is because we're adding air. So if you fill it up too high, it's going to be overflowing. Not that I've ever done that. <laughs> same, same. You learn the hard way. Um, when I'm steaming the milk, there is kind of a method that I use, and I try to stay consistent with where I'm putting the steam wand. Um, we're wanting to see kind of a whirlpool going in, um, and you want the steam wand to be about a centimeter away. Okay, so I'm going to be steaming that. I add a little bit. My of favorite air. part, watching it roll. <laughs> Okay, and then you just kind of, I've added the amount of um, air that I want. I'm just seeing it whirlpool, and then I'm just kind of kind of wait until it's as hot as I'd like it to be. Interesting, and so how do you gauge, I've seen people use thermometers, and I've seen use people do this, is there? Yeah, um, I've made several amounts of lattes, so I don't use the thermometer as much. Um, but for the rest of us who are gonna have no you idea. You go by um, kind of feeling it. Yeah, that's hot, holy yeah, crap. Yeah, so if you can't hold it for more than five seconds, you'll burn your, and that tummy. means it's the right temperature. Yeah. Interesting. So when you're looking at it, you're wanting it's to shiny. see kind of wet paint looking kind of thing. So that's a little too foamy for my taste. So I'll just take a little bit out. And then you don't want to wait too, too long when you're doing it um, because the bubbles will separate with the milk, kind of like a milkshake. Yeah. So when I'm pouring it, I kind of want to pull three quarters and then you get really close to make it look prettier. Yeah. Look at that, it made a heart! <laughs>
one of the episodes this month or listen to one of the episodes this month. I don't care if you scroll through it mm -hmm. uh, to go and find out what the code is because it's on the screen and we mention it usually at the end of every show. I don't care how you do it, but once you have it, then you just have to go to our FFF VIP lounge. Uh, when it asks you what the entry code is, you just type it in and then one of us gives you the thumbs up and the approval and welcome aboard. You're also going to get for this week, I did a recipe for a uh, coffee crusted pork roast last night. <laughs> I know. I know. So I just put the video part in the VIP lounge today and then I'm going to type up the details of the recipe and the spice rub and that will be up on this weekend as well. I've got a pork loin. I wonder if that would work on Yes, that. it will. Mm. Yes. No, what I'm having for dinner this weekend. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. So all I did was, I, anyways, I just did a, a quick little thing. It's that once you have that, learn that one rub, it can be used for a lot of different things like ribs and stuff would be good for the summer too. That would be good. But you only get that if you're in the VIP lounge. So. In so, the meantime, I tell you. in the meantime, please rate and subscribe on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. Five stars and would be nice. Subscribe on your our YouTube channel. Super easy. I've done it. When you're on YouTube and you're watching this right now, if you, there's like right under here, there's like a red subscribe button. Just click on subscribe. And give us a like. Give us a like. There's a little thumbs up thing. Click on that. Um, in iTunes, you scroll down to the bottom. You can actually review us. Scroll down to the bottom of the list of all of our episodes. Give us you know, five stars would be great. Uh, and if you're not giving us five stars, let us know why and we'll make it better for you. And again, uh, through any of our social media channels, uh, always don't be afraid to send us some uh, comments, some shout outs. This is what I'd like to see. This is what I didn't like. You know, maybe Cynthia should stop swearing so much, whatever that, whatever that looks like. Uh, or maybe she should be swearing more. Except for it's going to be like a regular segment now. <laughs> so if you know any WTAFs that you think yes. that she needs to talk about in future episodes, you can send us those as well. So on any of the social media channels, uh, or you can send us an email always at uh, flavor at stephaniepichet.ca. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go and finish my my flat white. Cheers. Me. Cheers. Mm. Actually, salute. Thanks so much for watching this video. We love putting it together. It's so much fun. All of our favorite things, good food, good drinks, a lot of travel talk, and we put it all together in one fun show. So make sure you follow us here, click on the videos below, uh, follow, subscribe, and find us on your favorite podcast player. We'll see you at our next trip.